Yes, I like to finish the paintings to make it 11 panels, but I certainly don't know when I could find the time to do it. But I'm a big dreamer in my whole life, and when I aim at seriously, I hope my dream will come true. She's a very sweet person. She's small and... Uh, so wise. I refer to her as Yoda's wife. <laughs> and since she's the female side of it, you know, she, she's very Jedi. And, uh, yeah, she, she speaks softly but carries a lightsaber. Art to me is an innate desire to express yourself. So it's almost like life itself. The story of Eagle's art is a story about self-searching and self-discovery. Yuko's art brings form of nature to us so that we can stand before it and witness it. Well, first big stones piling on top of the other, and then the, those stones fell down from out of nowhere, falling down stone. You feel the weight of those stones. Some of the stones are, are jutting out into space. You feel the stones jutting out into space. And after falling down, the stones cracked and then crushed and it became pebbles. And I painted some pebbles all stretched on the universe. You look at it from afar and you see this image of mountains and a landscape, and, but then you look at it from closer and you see that it's composed by all these small dots of paint. Looking at under microscope, you can see stone has many, many particles, many tiny dots. And so I started using pointillistic technique, but I called my technique dotism because it's dot, 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 millions of dots. Although her technique has similarities with pointillism, in which small distinct dots of pure color are applied in patterns to form an image, Eagle's dotism is not interested in exploring colors. Instead, Eagle's dots are concrete particles of the visual matter used to create new worlds. Naturally, the stone changes the forms from big one, smaller one, and then pebbles change to sand. So I landed on the dunes. Dunes are totally different from solid stones themselves. Dune has its, its own movement by itself, by the wind. I just follow it. The last painting I did was just before I opened up the War Center. So that was 1996.
What began as another landscape piece turned out to be the crown of Yuko's artistic expression, the harmony of natural forms told in the colors of spectrum. We have seven, seven colors on Earth, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and purple. If you place them in a circle, you know, it would go from uh, light to dark. Over the years, the Spectrum series evolved into 300 square feet of dots, becoming the physical manifestation of Yuko's creative endeavors. Like we're standing over, you know, a great gorge or a canyon or something. It really is amazing work, and when you see it in person, of course, scale is part of the experience. You have to see how big it is and how much work she did to uh, complete it to appreciate exactly what it is. I found this building in January 1996, and I could no longer paint because I became too busy. And so I'm not painting at all, this is it. I know why she stopped, you're standing there, right here. When Yuko dedicates herself to something, she sacrifices. It seems that she's decided that it's so much more important than her work that she gave up her work for the Wa Center. That's a great sacrifice, like cutting off one's arm. So she is a very unique human being, and that's the reason I'm here today trying to help her. And I have to finish. I haven't finished, you know, touching here and there, because I never put those paintings together so that I can improve a little more. With only two paintings of the series missing, the two extremes of the spectrum, black and white, this work stays a missing link in Yuko's life the bridge that connects Yuko before and after the Wa Center. Born in 1942 in Tokyo, Japan, Yugo grew up in the world of constant social and political turmoil. As a consequence, she quickly learned how to cope with the chaos around her. There's always chaos in the world, and in your own mind, you kind of had an order. Maybe I'm, because I'm a painter selecting, you know, composing, I compose, I choose my color, I choose to themes, in my own mind, I'm always, you know, seeing the things in my kind of selected way. At an early age, Yuko decided to see herself as an artist. Unfortunately, post-war Japan was in dire need of a different kind of artistry. The country was rebuilding itself, and the creativity Yuko had in mind was of secondary importance. Japan is a wonderful country with beautiful culture and traditions, but very strict and at that time doesn't allow women to be free enough to express themselves. Well, 1964 was the Olympic year for Japan. Everybody is in the spirit of innovations and then modernizations. Everybody was encouraged to have a big dream, and that was a strong force behind us and behind me. And so a big dream, but can I have a big dream in my country where uh, there are lots of restrictions or lack of freedom? Yuko refused to fall victim to the outside circumstances. After finishing her studies in English literature at Oyamagakin University, she decided to take her life into her own hands. I left at age 20 to the United States of America and dreaming of a big dream and the dream was to express myself as an artist, to be an artist. In 1963, Yuko moved to St. Paul, Minnesota. At McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota, I majored in fine art, mainly posting paintings. Of course, it was not easy and for me to adjust my life to the United States, to American life. But I determined to accept and then adjust myself to a new life. 
And so what I did was just to concentrate on painting, pursuing art. My dream of being an artist, and it was an artist's egg, was established there. Indeed, we do have that particular painting. It needs to be, you know, uh, varnished. It's getting dirty. It's so old. Anyway. When did you paint that one? Oh, that would be about 1968, thereabouts. It's a pretty old painting. You painted it in 1968. That's just about the time when you met her. Two yeah, it's about the time, a couple of years yeah. afterwards. So, did Yuko influence me? That's the I met her while she was attending the Minneapolis Institute of Art. She had just graduated from McAllister College and uh, was doing some studies preliminary to her time of coming to New York City and going to Pratt. So we go to talk at the Institute and I discover he was a painter and studying philosophy. My art was always based upon ideas, usually ideas related to science fiction or horror you know, devils and monsters fighting each other. After meeting Yuko, I began to uh, absorb her ideas uh, of philosophy, what the universe is, the mind and spirit. I even started working in her style. And then he started dotting. I said, how dare you? The world is one thing indeed, it's spirit. And the noumenal or material world is just an illusion, more or less. It's useful to us. In, in our operating within uh, this universe. But still, spirit is everything. We're all aspects of the mind of God. I believe that whatever is dark is just the darkness before the dawn, and all will be well in the end. And that's Yuko's idea, too. Terence has that identity of Yuko in his work, and he is creating a, a Bosch-like atmosphere of uh, you know heavily populated landscapes with what I've seen of Yuko's uh, shapes and detail and attention to pattern and form and uh, texture that the overall effect you know when you first see it is that of a spectacular landscape and of course then she had to leave to her great adventure in New York City and I was sad to see her go and I never expected to see her again And then I decided, well, I'm going to go out to New York, too, you know, because I think Minneapolis did not have the opportunities I was looking for either. So I came out to Brooklyn, and uh, lo and behold, the apartment I rented was nearby Yuko. And we bumped into each other. She's going to Pratt. And so New York City makes people meet each other somehow. And uh, from there on, we've always been, you know, side by side working together. When I came to New York and bumped into Yuko again, she was completely happy. She was in her element. Naturally, I fell in love with New York City. People don't speak English in the way that I heard in the Midwest. And they have all sorts of accents and all different kinds of races and uh, colors and so on. So you have Italians, you have blacks, you have Chinese, you have every ethnicity there is. And there was a civil rights movement, feminist movements, field paintings, pop art, hard edge art, you name it, there are so many different movements. Whether you're a woman, whether you're Japanese, or whether you're, you know, from any other part of the world, you can make it in New York. After I finished Pratt Institute, that was 1969, and tried to look for uh, galleries in the city, and that was the time that I hit the reality. The 1970s plunged Yugo into the disparaging world of the New York City artist, a role she learned to play through compromise. What I expressed on my canvases were totally different from what New York art galleries were seeking. She became an art teacher to keep herself financially afloat, while attempting to stay relevant through new works that furthered her immersion into the elements. This stage of production exhibited some of her most telling acts of expression. She really was a participant on the gallery scene at that time. Still, an artist is always on the edge and never quite in, in the arena of the Metropolitan Museum or Museum of Modern Art or, or the Whitney because there are, of course, thousands and thousands of artists in New York competing 
for that golden apple. I can tell you one thing, that that helped uh, formulate Yuko's vision when she opened the WA Center. She wanted to be open to, to every artist, you know, whatever, wherever they're from. And the only thing that mattered was the art itself. While most artists were fighting to be noticed in the hot spots of the East Village 80s art scene, Yugo decided to make a break. She wanted to find a new space, one that would embrace her style and others who didn't fit the standard. Brooklyn became that refuge, and Williamsburg her opus. 1986 was the first time to move into Williamsburg. At that time, Williamsburg was rife with gangs, drugs, burnt out wrecks of cars, it was a horrible place to live. People who live near me were telling me, you're going to get killed, you better go home. I didn't know what they're talking about. To everybody's surprise, instead of leaving, Yuko decided to invest. She's brilliant, not only as an artist, but she's a brilliant businesswoman. And that's how she went from acquiring the first uh, cooperative department to using that, leveraging up to buying a, a building, and, and improving that and leveraging that to buy another property and another property. Made a little fortune each time. She rented out uh, space to artists at a very low price and uh, she's one of the reasons that artists began to trickle in from Manhattan where the prices for, for apartments were too high. At that point Williamsburg was starting to be a famous uh, destination for artists to move uh, for cheap rent and it had that atmosphere of the frontier, you know, the, the artists on the frontier uh, doing uh, things that couldn't happen in Manhattan anymore. Most of my tenants were artists much younger than me and then they started having uh, performance here and there in a small place. More galleries were opening up and and crime was diminishing a little bit. Eventually, Williamsburg became very attracted to real estate development. People were buying buildings, fixing them up, and putting in restaurants. Restauranteurs would come. Became a hot spot for tourists, even even slightly run down. Tourists come and see the burnt out cars, you know, and the Hasidic community, and this and that. And have see an artist party that ran all night. I mean, that's a wild, wild thing. And people heard about this in Berlin and in Tokyo. You know, Mexico City, everywhere they came. Williamsburg has become to the international art community, so we need a little bigger space. Once again, Hugo decided to invest, but this time without profit in mind. I must tell you, at age 40, I decided to make my own Yukoni Foundation because I don't have a child, and whatever I have, small fortune, teeny one, I can leave to help artists. She'd always wanted to build a foundation, you know, or an art center, because she wanted to help other people, artists especially, did not have a venue to exhibit their art. And it's not so much that she wanted to give artists money, but she wanted to give the artists a great place to show. She'd been driving around Williamsburg back and forth to various things, you know, uh, and she dro kept driving by this, this beautiful building. Oh, what a wonderful building. One day there's a sign on the building, for sale. So I called immediately, and then landlord came to show me this building. That was 1996. Well, the building was built in the 1860s. It's on the National Register of Historic Places, and the seventh building in all of New York to be landmarked. It was a bank built for rich men, and like the Perpont Morgans, the Vanderbilts, the Fisks, all very wealthy Americans, the Havermeyers, the Sugar Barons, all banked here. Well, I said immediately, this is perfect for multifaceted total art center. But they didn't believe her at first, this petite little Japanese lady quietly coming in, oh, I think I want to buy the building. Well, to their surprise, she made an offer. She didn't take me seriously. She put me down, and uh, you cannot do that. Me, being an artist, so many artists have come, wished to buy the buildings that nothing ever happened. 200 people came before you. When she finally put down her money, she only had $50 left in her bank account. 
That's that, but she believed, and I believe too. And that's how it started. Center means in Japanese and Chinese character is peace, harmony, or unity. There are three meanings depending upon how you write it coincidentally. So that became my mission too because through the international language of art you come to understand, you come to respect each other. We happen to be right next to the Williamsburg Bridge. Unless we have a bridge, there's no understanding. Take, for instance, if we meet each other, how do you do? Shake hand. That is a bridge made already. And then we start conversing, and then we start getting to know each other. So the bridge means to communicate. It's the idea that we're all part of this world, and we have to accommodate each other. We have to build bridges of understanding. Bridge between you and me, young and old, men and women, fine art and performing art. The bridge between uh, emerging and established artists. Bridge between dance, theater, music. Opera performances, jazz performances, experimental music performances, rock bands. Images on the wall, uh, paintings and photographs, you have sculptures, you have installations. All the races, all the ethnicities, all the cultures, there's something beautiful in each. And we want every person in the world to see that. There's some beauty in, in everything and everybody. And it all comes through the wall center in the form of art. My vision came very clear upon seeing this building. Third floor, it used to be ballroom for the wealthy people, so there's no pillars standing on the floor. It will be perfect for performing art. Second floor, you can see there is no windscot. All the way down to the floor is a wall, and 16 feet high ceiling. It will be perfect for fine art. First floor used to be a bank. We call it reception hall. We have poetry reading, small scale lectures, seminars, chamber music, dinner parties, or a small jazz concert. She blends it all. You know, I'm thinking about the dancers who were here last night. You know, there were French dancers and German dancers and Japanese dancers and American dancers and, you know, people from all over the place. And you would think, well, that could get a little confusing, but no, she makes it all work and it has this flow to it. Each show is very different, but each show uh, is consistent within itself. It's great. A home for art of all kinds and a room for art of all kinds. I'd have to think hard to think of any ga other gallery in Brooklyn that's 16 years old. A lot of galleries come, they open their round for two or three years, and then they close. And one of the reasons is, is the good taste of, of Yuko and Terrence to select art to put on exhibit that's really interesting and accessible. People don't have to be an art expert or to get the art or understand it they could look at it and feel engaged by the art that they show here. I mean, everything is accomplished. It remains there in their control, and it remains their open vision, permissive, in that it gives other people the opportunity to create their vision, their own unique vision. I think both Yuko and Terry, they're doing an amazing job in what they do here, in running the law center and filling this place with art. It's such a beautiful building and it has such nice ambience and to bring Yuko's bridge concept to life here, I think it's a very uh, big but also very fulfilling task and a very inspiring aspect for everybody who steps in here. Yuko's life has become the WAH Center and the Yuko Ni Foundation. She lives for this place and she lives to expand its scope. 
it's become a Brooklyn institution, not just an artist institution. And that community that is more than just Williamsburg and uh, more than just a, a, an artist project is an accomplishment of UCO in, in these last uh, 16 years. This is the greatest lady, the greatest person I personally know. I've known her for about 45 years. And uh, she came to New York and uh, was a dynamo in the art world in Soho. And I would like to tell you that when she opened up, she worked with the community and the police and uh, caused a great change to Williamsburg, which was high crime and everything here. And she, she was so great that uh, Borough President Howard Golden named her a woman of the year and said that through her activity she has transformed all the northern part of Brooklyn. So that's, uh, this lady has made Williamsburg what it is today, the trendiest, hottest, cultural place in the world today. Can you imagine that? Here she stands. Yuko's last work, Spectrum Planet, remains a work in progress. Over time, however, this work became much more than a simple piece of art. It transformed into a symbol of Yuko's creative journey. Little by little, just like stone changing the formation, changing, you know, transformation going through, that's the way I see it. Good things come, taking a long time, just doesn't come overnight. So I give myself time, labor, and patience. That's all I can do. How does Yuko build what she builds? And it's just like one grain of sand at a time. She doesn't just throw her hands out and create worlds. She does it one piece at a time, one piece at a time, with patience. Peace, harmony, unity, patience. And then to create something like War Center is on the same process as artists create their own work. You think about theme and then how to achieve it and practically you achieve by experimenting this, experiment that. You have certain ideas in your head. So it is creative process, the same as uh, pursuing art. It is just creating towards the artist, not me. It is creating for the public, creating for the society. So there is a practical purpose there, and I created it. <laughs> I created that purpose. Mm -hmm.